Hey everyone, so I would like to do a reading today, oh no, a reading, of Stephen Kinsella's Estoppel, a new justification for individual rights. He's a patent lawyer out of uh, Houston, Texas, and I did interview him recently. I've been trying to better understand the non-aggression principle by um, you know, reading a, a number of different interpretations and justifications for it in libertarian ethics in general. So I'll go ahead and, and start up. Introduction. Add an E to the word stop and dress it up a little, and you get e estoppel, an interesting common law concept. e estoppel is a principle of equity or justice which is invoked by a judge to prevent or e stop a party from making a certain claim if the party's prior actions are in some sense inconsistent with making such a claim and if another relied on such prior actions to its detriment. For example, suppose your neighbor hires a painter to paint his house, but the painter mistakenly comes to your house and starts painting it. You see him doing this and realize the mistake the painter has made, but instead of stopping him and telling him of his mistake, you wave at the painter and allow him to finish, hoping to get a free paint job. Later, the painter asks you to pay him you refuse, he sues you for the price of the paint job. As a defense, you claim that you did not have a contract with the painter, which is true. At this point, however, the judge might say that you are stopped from making such a claim, that you did not have a contract, because it's inconsistent with your prior action of letting the painter continue painting your house, and because the painter, in good faith, relied on your actions to do this to his detriment. You will not be heard to claim that there was no contract, since you are prevented, he stopped, from urging that defense. You will lose the lawsuit, and you have to pay the painter. Since you acted as if you did have a contract, you cannot be heard to deny this later. On, you are stopped from denying it. As Lord Koch stated, the word estoppel is used because a man's own act or acceptance stoppeth or closeth upon his mouth to allege or plead the truth. This legal concept of estoppel has many other applications, but the specifics are not relevant here. Although it has historically been used in a legal setting, it harbors some very important political and philosophical ideas. Ideas which can be used to delimit and justify a libertarian theory of government. The heart of the idea behind estoppel is the idea of consistency. In the case of Legal estoppel, a man in court is told that he will not be heard to make a statement which is flatly inconsistent with earlier behavior, on which another relied upon. This idea of its insisting upon consistency has ever more potency in a debate, discussion, or argument, where a person's claims to be coherent must be consistent. By using a philosophical generalized version of the concept of estoppel, one can make a case for the free society. In general, I want to show how one can e-stop the state from justifying laws against non-aggressive behavior, and how one can e-stop individual aggressors from arguing against their imprisonment or punishment. This is effectively equivalent to validating the non-aggression principle, which states that no person has the right to aggress against another, that any action whatsoever is permissible as long as it does not involve aggression against others. Aggression is defined as the initiation of the use or threat of physical violence against the person or property of anyone else. Applying estoppel proves, if the state proportionally punishes an aggressor, his rights are not violated. And if the state punishes a non-aggressor, his rights are violated. Thus, the non-aggression principle is a necessary, but not sufficient, condition for the validity of any law. So let's see how. Number two, estoppel and its validity. The estoppel principle is merely a convenient way to apply the requirement of consistency to arguers. Under this principle, a person is estopped from making certain claims, statements, or arguments if the claims urged are clearly inconsistent and contradictory. To say a person is estopped from making certain claims means that the claims cannot even possibly be right because they are contradictory, and thus they should be disregarded. They should not be heard. 
the core of the estoppel principle is consistency. Consistency is insisted upon in any argumentative claim because an argument is an attempt to find the truth. If an arguer need not be consistent, the very activity of argumentation, or truth finding, cannot even occur. For example, if Mark states that A is true and that not A is also simultaneously true, we know immediately that Mark is wrong, that A and not A cannot both be true. In short, it is impossible for a person to coherently, intelligibly assert in a discussion or, or argument that two contradictory statements are true. It is impossible for his claims to be true. Thus, he is stopped from asserting them. He is not heard to utter them, because they cannot tend to establish the truth, which is the goal of all argumentation. Rarely will an arguer state that both A and not A are true. However, whichever an arguer states A is true, and also necessarily holds that not A is true, the inconsistency is still there. And he is still stopped from explicitly claiming that A is true and implicitly claiming that not A is true. He might be able to remove the inconsistency by dropping one of the claims, but this is not always possible. For example, Andrew might argue that argumentation is impossible, but since he is currently arguing, he must necessarily implicit hold that he is arguing and that therefore argumentation is possible. He would be stopped from urging these two contradictory claims one explicit and one implicit, and he could not drop the second claim that argumentation is possible, for he cannot help but hold this view while engaged in argumentation itself. By engaging in argument, one is necessarily trying to arrive at the truth, since consistency is a necessary condition of discovering truth. Any arguer who is implicitly accepting the consistency requirement, i.e. the estoppel principle, and would contradict himself if he denied its validity. If my opponent says that incons inconsistency in claims is not fatal to truth, then he could never claim that my opposing view, that consistency is necessary, is incorrect, because it is merely inconsistent with his. Thus, he could not deny the truth of my view. But such a position is nonsensical, for my opponent would be claiming that his view, that consistency is unnecessary, and my view, that consistency is necessary, are both true, a blatant contradiction. Thus, any arguer must also accept the validity of the estoppel principle, for it, as explained above, is merely a convenient way to apply the requirement of consistency, which any arguer does and must accept. In effect, any arguer is, esto is stopped from denying the validity of estoppel, because to deny its validity is to deny the necessity of consistency to argumentation, which is it itself an inconsistent position. Estoppel is used in this paper against various types of arguers. It is used against an aggressor objecting to his punishment, and against the state objecting to a non-aggressive prisoner's assertion of his rights. It is also used implicitly against anyone who would argue against the validity of estoppel and the results of its application. The results of applying estoppel, as shown below, is the well-known libertarian non-aggression principle. The justification of this rule is significant, for it can be used to justify a libertarian form of government. Number three, applying estoppel. The conduct of individuals can be divided into two types coercive or aggressive, i.e. involving the initiation of force, and non-coercive or non-aggressive. This division is purely descriptive. It is unobjectionable because it does not assume that aggression is invalid, immoral, or unjustifiable. It only assumes that at least some action can be objectively classified as either aggressive or non-aggressive. The government acts through the enforcement of laws. Laws are aimed at conduct and thus can similarly be divided into two types of laws, those that proscribe aggressive behavior and those that proscribe non-aggressive behavior. Both types of laws will be examined through the estoppel eyepiece. A. Laws Restricting Aggressive Behavior Let us examine the effect of the estoppel principle on laws against aggression. The clearest and most severe instances of aggression is murder. How would an anti-murder law fare? Under such a law, the state uses force of some sort, 
execution, punishment, imprisonment, monetary fine, etc., against an individual who has been determined to have murdered another. Suppose that John murders Ralph, and the state convicts and imprisons John. Now, if John objects to this punishment, he is claiming that the government should not, ought not, indeed must not, treat him this way. By such normative talk, John claims he has a right to not be treated this way. He claims that such aggression is wrong. However, this claim is blatantly inconsistent with what must be the defendant's other position. Since he murdered Ralph, which is clearly an aggression, his actions have been indicated that he also holds the view that aggression is not wrong. John, by his earlier action and its necessarily implications is he stopped from reclaiming that aggression is wrong and if he cannot even claim that aggression the initiation of force is wrong then he cannot make the subsidiary claim that retaliatory force is wrong he cannot assert contradictory claims he is stopped from doing so the only way to maintain consistency is to drop one of his claims if he retains only the claim aggression is proper then he's failing to object to his imprisonment if he drops his claim that aggression is proper and retains only the claim aggression is wrong, he indeed could object to his imprisonment. But as we shall see in section 3b1 below, it is impossible for him to drop his claim that aggression is proper. proper. To restate, if John does not claim that murder is wrong, he cannot claim this, for it contradicts his view that murder is not wrong, evidenced by this by his previous murder, he is stopped from asserting such inconsistent claims. Then, if the state attempts to kill him, he cannot complain about it because he cannot know, be heard to, say that such a killing by the state is wrong, immoral, or improper. And if he cannot complain if the state proposes to kill him, a fortiori, he cannot complain if the state merely imprisons him. b. Necessary claims and their proper form Number one, changes of mind, denunciation of prior action. John could attempt to rebuke this application of estoppel, however, by claiming that he, in fact, does not currently maintain that aggression is improper, that he has changed his mind since the time when he murdered Ralph. He is attempting to use the simultaneity requirement, whereby an arguer is he stopped from asserting that A is simultaneously true and not true? John is urging that he does not hold both contradictory ideas. Aggression is proper, aggression is improper. Now, that he is only asserting the latter, and thus is not he stopped from objecting to his imprisonment. But John traps himself by this argument. If John now maintains that the initiation of force is improper, then by his own current view, his earlier murder was improper, and John necessarily denounces his earlier actions and is admitting the propriety of punish, punishing him for these actions, which is enough to justify punishing him. And of course, it would also be inconsistent of him to deny what he admits, and he's thus he stopped from doing so. Furthermore, if John denounces his murder of Ralph, he is stopped from objecting to the punishment of that murder. For to maintain that a murder should not, must not, be punished is inconsistent with the claim that murder should not, must not, occur. Also, finally, John could argue that he never did hold the view that murder is not wrong. That he murdered despite the fact that he held it to be wrong, and thus he does not have to change his mind. But even in this case, John admits that murder is wrong and that he murdered Ralph and still ends up denouncing his earlier action. Thus, he is again he stopped from objecting to his punishment, and in the situation where he claims to have changed his mind. Thus, whether John currently holds both views or only one of them, he is still he stopped from objecting to his imprisonment. This is why the requirement of simultaneity, which is part of the consistency rule, is satisfied even when a criminal is being punished for his prior actions. Indeed, it is only for prior, or at least currently occurring, actions, that a criminal can be punished. Either he still maintains his previous view, that aggression is not wrong, which is inconsistent with his objection to being punished, or he has changed his mind, in which case he is denouncing his prior actions, which is again inconsistent with an objection to being punished, and which is also an admission that punishment is proper. Thus, 
he can be deemed to hold both his current view that aggression is improper and his prior view that aggression is proper simultaneously for the result is the same his objection to being punished will not be heard number two the requirement for universalizability it could also be objected that the estoppel principle is being improperly applied that john does not in fact hold inconsistent views is not asserting inconsistent claims instead of having the contradictory views that aggression is proper and aggression is improper, John could claim to instead hold a different but not inconsistent position that aggression by me is proper and aggression by the state against me is improper. However, we must recall that John, in objecting to the state's imprisonment of him, is engaging in argument. He's arguing that the state should not, for some reason, imprison him. If he should, there shows that he is speaking of a norm. As Hans Hermann Hoppe states, quite commonly has been observed that argumentation implies a proposition claims universal acceptability or should it be a norm proposal that it is universalizable applied to norm proposals this is the idea as formulated in the golden rule of ethics or in the Kantian categorical imperative that only those norms can be justified that can be formulated as general principles which are valid for everyone without exception Thus, the proper way to select the norm with which the arguer is exerting is to ensure that it is universal universalizable. The views that aggression by me is improper and aggression by the state against me is improper clearly do not pass the test. The view that aggression is or is not proper is by contrast universalizable and is thus the proper form for a norm. When applying estoppel, then, the arguer's claim to be examined must be the universalizable form. He cannot escape the application of estoppel by arbitrarily specializing his otherwise inconsistent views with liberally sprinkled for me onlys. Since he is engaged in arguing about norms, the norms asserted by, by him must be universalizable. Thus, we can see that applying the principle of estoppel would not hinder the prevention of violent crimes. For the above murder analysis can be applied to any sort of course of violent crime. All the classical violent crimes would still be preventable under the new scheme as they are today. All forms of aggression, rape, theft, murder, assault, trespass, and even fraud will still be proper crimes. A rapist, e.g., could only complain about being imprisoned by saying that his rights are being violated by the aggressive imprisonment of him, but he would be stopped from saying that aggression is wrong. In general, any act of any aggressive act, one involving the initiation of violence, would cause an inconsistency with the act later claimed that he should not be imprisoned or punished in some manner. But should the punishment in some sense be proportional to the crime? This question is addressed in Section 3D after first considering limits on the state action against non-aggressors. C. Laws restricting non-aggressive behavior. Besides the laws that restrict aggressive course of behavior, there are laws aimed at ostensibly peaceful behavior. Minimum wage laws, anti-pornography laws, anti-drug laws, etc. How would estoppel affect the validity of these laws? It can be shown that the government is estopped from enforcing certain laws. More precisely, it is estopped from claiming that it has the right to use force against a given person. But note that, even if we can say that the government is estopped from imprisoning a certain person, says Susan, this of course does not mean that the state is prevented from doing so. The principle of estoppel could, at most, be used to show that the government's justification for imprisoning Susan is inadequate. Let us take an example. Suppose Susan publishes a patently pornographic magazine in a jurisdiction with anti-pornography laws. The state convicts and imprisons her. Unless Susan wants to go to prison, she will not consent. She will object. She will assert that the government is violating her rights by its use of force against her. The government should not do this. Now, the government may attempt to be clever and use the estoppel argument against her to stop her from objecting to her imprisonment. However, Susan is not stopped from complaining about her confinement. She's complaining about the aggression against her. The prior action in question was the publishing of pornographic magazines. This action is in no way aggressive. Thus, Susan has not engaged in any activity nor necessarily made any claim which would be inconsistent with her claim, claiming that aggression is wrong. Perhaps she could be stopped from complaining about other pornographers, but she's is here complaining about her being kidnapped by the state. Thus, the state cannot use estoppel to prevent Susan from objecting to her imprisonment. So it may, in the murder example above, in section 3a, if the state imprisons or punishes Susan, it is an aggressor. 
an initiator of force. By application of the East Topple principle, it can be shown that the state has no right to engage in this activity. For suppose Susan asserts the right to use defensive force against the state in order to escape her confinement, even though she lacks the ability to mount such an attack. The state could not assert that Susan has no right to use force against it, for it is currently, by its action of imprisoning Susan, admitting the validity of aggression. So Susan may assert that she has a right to attack the government, and the government is to stop from denying her that claim. Furthermore, any third party, say a conservative who supports such anti-pornographic legislation, is also to stop from denying her claim. For, by claiming that the government's aggression is, is valid, he, too, is he stopped from denying Susan's assert, assertion of her rights. It would be non-universalizable of him to assert that Susan has no right to attack the government and that the government has a right to attack Susan. It would be inconsistent for him to assert that aggression is wrong, Susan attacking the government, and that aggression is right, the government attacking Susan. But once it is accepted, for it cannot be denied by anyone, that Susan has such a right to defend herself, it is clear that the state's action she has right to defend herself against are thus necessarily rights invasive. To establish that an action is rights invasive necessarily implies that it is proper, wrong, and moral, that it should not, must not, occur, that the state has no right to engage in such activity. To sum up, if the state imprisons Susan for a non coercive act, Susan is not stopped from, eject, from objecting. The state is stopped from denying Susan assertion of her right, regardless of her might, to retaliate, which implies that the state has no right to imprison her. Thus, it can be seen that any law restricting non coercive behavior is invalid, null and void, and every person and the state is stopped from arguing for its legitimacy. Letter D, proportional punishment. The above analysis in Section 3A, justifying the punishment of aggressors, does not mean that all concerns about proportionality may be dropped. Someone who commits a relatively minor coercive act is he stopped from complaining about what? Suppose the state attempts to execute a person whose only crime was the theft of a candy bar. He would complain that his right to life is about to be violated. Is he stopped from making such a claim? No, because he has done nothing inconsistent with such a claim to justify so st stopping him. He does not necessarily claim that aggressive killing is proper. The universalization requirement does not prevent him from reasonably narrowing his implicit claim to minor aggression, namely candy bar theft, is not wrong. Rather than the more severe, aggression is not wrong. In general, while the universalization principle prevents arbitrary particularization of claims, e.g. adding for me onlys, it does not rule out an objective, reasonable statement of the implicit claims of the aggressor tailored to the actual nature of the aggression and its necessary consequences and implications. E.g., while it is true that the, theft, that the thief has stolen a bar of chocolate, he has not attempted to take a person's life. That the, thus, he has never necessarily claimed that the murder is not wrong, so that he is not he stopped from asserting that murder is wrong. Since a candy bar thief is not stopped from complaining about his eminent execution, he can also assert his right to retaliate against the government, which is he stopped from denying it, which implies that the government has no right to execute him. If the nature of the punishment exceeds the nature of the aggression, the aggressor is no longer stopped from complaining about the excess punishment, and is able to argue that he has the right to attack the state. The state is stopped from denying this because, to the extent of the excess punishment, it is itself an aggressor which implies that the criminal has a right to not be disproportionately punished following the analysis used in the section 3C above. Number 4. Conclusion Principled application of the ESOP principle would result in the free society, for all coercive crimes could be punished, if not by the state, then at least by victims of their agents or defenders, and all non-coercive crimes could not be enforced. The estoppel principle has been used above both to justify certain types of government laws and to invalidate others. First, a person who has initiated forces to stop from arguing against his proportional punishment possesses inconsistent with other positions he necessarily holds or can be deemed to be hold. Second, a person who has not initiated force may not validly be imprisoned by the state because he will assert that this is a violation of his rights, which the state is he stopped from denying because of its course of imprisonment of him. Since an arguer is he stopped from denying the validity of his estoppel in general, 
he must accept its validity, and he must also accept the validity of the results of its application. The above framework establishes the validity of the libertarian non-aggression principle, which has been shown by many others to justify a libertarian or at least a minimalist or night watchman state. Thus, everyone must accept the validity of the free society. To argue otherwise is to argue for the inconsistency and to be inconsistent and to necessarily be wrong. Thank you very much. Sorry for the rather clunky um, wording by some of the uh, some of the terms, but I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, listen to our podcast at Renegade, the Renegade Variety Hour. You can also find us on iTunes and on YouTube. Thanks.